Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the GIS Sea Level Rise Seminar. Uh, today, we're very glad to have uh, Dr. Sridhar Anandakrishnan. He is a professor in the Department of Geosciences at Penn State University. And uh, Professor Anandakrishnan is a geophysicist who is interested in the response of ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland to climate change. And his interests involve using geophysical tools, seismology, ice penetrating radar, and GPS to understand glacier flow. Uh, Professor Ananda Krishnan is involved in the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration as principal investigator of the GHOST project, focused on observations and modeling of the bed and interior of Thwaites Glacier, and also a co investigator of the MELT project focused on melting at the Thwaites grounding line, grounding zone, and its uh, control on sea level. He's also involved in a project studying calving and flow of Helheim Glacier in Antarctica and the Green Drill Project, um, an effort to map the history of the Greenland ice sheet by drilling into bedrock. Uh, Professor Ananda Krishnan earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from Columbia University and his PhD in geophysics from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And he has been associated with Penn State since 1992 and a professor at Penn State since 2002. And today, uh, Professor Ananda Krishnan will be speaking on the topic, slip sliding away, Thwaites Glacier in the next decades. So, welcome. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, give a talk at, uh, at GIS. I hope I could have come and visited. Uh, I always uh, love to return to my old stomping grounds. Uh, I graduated from Columbia and back, I lived uh, on 122nd Street and uh, Broadway back when GIS was up at Riverside and 120th Street. So if I took the long way around to campus, I would go by there all the time. Uh, I have a vague recollection as an undergraduate of taking uh, an intro astronomy class that I think was taught by Bob Jastrow, but uh, fortunately it wasn't a climate change class, it was an astronomy class, so that was good. Uh, and um, uh, my association with Columbia continued when I went to Wisconsin because uh, my advisor there, Charlie Bentley, uh, that graduated from Columbia. And those of you who, uh, I assume most of you or a lot of you are associated with Columbia. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, perhaps this will strike a chord with you. Charlie told me that um, he graduated from, he got his PhD at, at Columbia, uh, defended his thesis, and the next week uh, had everybody sign it and so on. Next week got on a boat to go to Antarctica and he was gone for two years. He spent the summer, then the next winter, then the next summer in Antarctica. When he came back, <clears throat> he had a letter waiting for him saying, you have a library fine. We cannot give you your thesis until this is cleared. And so the official date for his thesis was two years later. He tried desperately to get Columbia administration to recognize that he'd been in Antarctica, but to no avail. So anyways, those of you at Columbia may recognize that story in yourself. I, I certainly do. Uh, so uh, I am going to be talking about Thwaites. Let me try and uh, start up my uh, PowerPoint here. Uh... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, Thwaites Glacier. Uh, I'm at Penn State University and at the uh, uh, Earth and Environmental uh, Systems Institute there. Um, it says my screen sharing is paused. Uh, did, this, did the title change or is it still on the title page? Uh, yeah, we're seeing the, uh, the keynote. Map of Antarctica. But, but not in presentation mode. Uh, hmm. All right. Let me tell you, after all this time, you think we could figure out Zoom, but I apologize.
I think if I go to full screen on this or or the presentation now, does it look better now? Uh, we're still seeing the um. Uh, we're not seeing the full screen mode, but uh, oh dear, oh dear. But, but uh, we can see the slides. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, we'll just go with that. Ah, uh, all righty. Uh, uh, actually, so, uh, sorry. Now yeah. it's, um, something strange happened. We're just seeing uh, a small portion of the screen. Maybe if you press play on there. Any better? Okay. Yes, that's good now. <laughs> I, I, my apologies. Uh, all right. Uh, so I'll be talking about Antarctica. Uh, uh, most of you know where that is, and and what. Uh, it, uh, just to orient you, uh, the um, uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia are off the bottom, and then the Pacific goes around to the left there, and then the peninsula is where South America and, and eventually North America are, and then it continues on around through the Atlantic and so on. Um, so uh, the, I'm gonna talk very briefly about glaciers and sea level. I suspect most people on here know a great deal about, about everything, but it's always good to have uh, everybody kind of on the same page. On the right hand side uh, is a photograph of uh, Thwaites Glacier. This is the ice shelf. Uh, front, um, and you can see that 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 big cliff that's uh, floating ice of the of the Thwaites Glacier ice shelf, and then heading back into the distance is the sort of flat part of the ice shelf, and then eventually connects to the main part. In the foreground, you got ocean, a lot of uh, sea ice that's uh, pieces of sea ice that have formed. Um, so uh, very very briefly, glaciers and sea level. Uh, as I said, most people here are probably fully on board with this. Uh, water exchanges between the oceans and ice sheets continuously. And it is the balance of that exchange that really controls sea level. Now there's many other factors, the primary one being um, uh, the thermospheric effect where the warming of the, of the oceans is, is making it larger. And then there's smaller effects, mountain glaciers and 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 um, groundwater and so on. But in the in the years going forward, decades to centuries going forward, it's really the uh, ice sheets that are going to be the main um, uh, sort of uh, controller or 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 source of water uh, for for sea level. Uh, and again, in in very schematic form, you get evaporation from the oceans, snowfall on the ice sheets. And then the ice flow, that blue arrow on the bottom there that returns uh, that snowfall back to the ocean over the scale of uh, anywhere from decades to centuries to millennia, uh, ice flow returns that ocean to, uh, it returns that ice to the ocean. And then uh, the cycle uh, uh, um, continues. Uh, it uh, is the balance between these factors, between evaporation from the oceans and, and snowfall and mass return to the oceans that really controls both ice sheet size and um, global sea level. Uh, I'll be talking almost exclusively about that, that blue arrow uh, labeled ice flow. Uh, there's uh, folks at Columbia who look at surface uh, uh, issues such as accumulation and wind redistribution, look at the atmosphere, look at the oceans, um, and but I'll be talking mainly about ice flow. I should mention that the Green Drill project that Patrick uh, 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 talked about is uh, one in collaboration with uh, folks at Lamont, York Schaefer and others at, at Lamont. So 
Uh, I encourage you to uh, bring him down and give a, a talk on this as well. Uh, I think it would be very interesting. They had a, uh, we all had very successful seasons in Greenland just now with some drilling work that went on and some some geophysical work as well. So I think it'd be great if you could have him on. Um, uh, this is a sort of a zoomed in version with a little more detail. Uh, on the left, you have an ice sheet, and that would be, for example, in my case, either Thwaites Glacier or uh, in Greenland, uh, Helheim Glacier or Jakobshaven. And eventually, at some point, it goes afloat in a floating ice shelf. And it's these um, interactions between a warming atmosphere and a warming ocean uh, and the melt uh, uh, of the ice shelves that really uh, initiates changes in, in large ocean terminating glaciers, such as Thwaites Glacier. Uh, it's uh, the, the surface of Antarctica is still rel up here, is still relatively cold. Um, uh, it's some models suggest that it's going to warm it rapidly enough in Antarctica that even uh, the surface will start to melt the way it melts in Greenland. But as of now, we're still seeing uh, cold enough temperatures that uh, the surface is not at an issue in the flow of uh, uh, Antarctic glaciers, the way the surface is an issue in the flow of Greenland glaciers because surface melt water can penetrate to the bed. Well, that's not happening at Thwaites Glacier, at least at least not currently. Uh, what is happening in uh, Antarctica is warming ocean, changing um, uh, wind patterns, uh, which are affecting the ice shelf. And the ice shelf is obviously connected to the glacier, to the ice sheet. And, and it's that uh, interaction that initiates the change well, once that change is initiated, how Thwaites Glacier or other glaciers respond uh, is uh, controlled to a large degree by what we call subglacial conditions or the properties of the rock, water, sediments. Uh, if you can see my uh, arrow moving on the left side, that transition from the blue ice of the ice sheet to the brown rock underneath it's the properties of that zone um, and, and a zone at fairly high detail, uh, uh, down 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 meters. Uh, the glacier isn't really uh, cognizant of conditions down there. It's really at this interface. The top centimeters to meters are, are all that, 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 that really matter. It's all that the glacier uh, is really aware of, uh, of the rocks beneath. Uh, the one caveat to that is heat flow. Obviously, uh, deeper processes affect the amount of heat that comes up from underneath. But uh, in terms of physical properties, it's the uh, it's that it's that thin interface of, as I said, centimeters to meters that 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 really interacts uh, between the ice and and the rock. And it's that zone that our project, uh, the Ghost Project, in um, in Antarctica, the Melt Project uh, and Green Drill and, and the Helheim Project, all of them are really aimed at trying to image and, and model and understand that interface as best we can in order to project what these, when I say subglacial conditions control rate, we need to know what those subglacial con conditions are, and then we need to um, see how they uh, uh, interact with the uh, dynamics of ice flow and how those rates could change in the future as the ocean initiates some changes in the glacier. All right, uh, this is extremely brief. The threats to Thwaites Glacier and indeed to all glaciers is obviously rising global temperatures. Uh, this is a plot possibly from NASA GIS. I wouldn't be surprised. I actually think it is um, uh, showing uh, uh, average global temperature. This won't be a surprise to anybody on this talk, I don't think, uh, but temperatures are rising and are continuing to rise. And I think we're projected to have a, uh, a record high this year. Uh, ice don't like warmth. And so uh, we were, uh, we're in, that, in, in, in this part of the graph where temperatures are rising and ice is responding to that.
So uh, moving uh, in more detail to the uh, confusing continent, uh, yet more confusion. Uh, I told you that uh, uh, Antarctica was uh, at the South Pole and from the South Pole, everything was North. Well, just to make it more uh, uh, interesting yet, uh, Antarctica is more or less arbitrarily divided into two halves, East Antarctica and West Antarctica. Um, as you look at this map, uh, the Greenwich Meridian or the Prime Meridian uh, goes straight up through the line and the 180 degree Meridian goes down through the bottom and more or less everything to the right of that is considered East Antarctica and everything to the West is West Antarctica. Uh, the key uh, sort of geological uh, distinction and glaciological uh, climate distinction between the two is uh, that West Antarctica is for the most part below sea level. So if you were to magically rip off all the ice from Antarctica, you would find a big continent above sea level in East Antarctica, you would find a huge ocean embayment in West Antarctica with a few mountains, uh, which, are net, which will now be islands uh, sticking, up through the, sticking up through the water. And that has very uh, uh, significant consequences for how uh, East Antarctica and West Antarctica uh, react and interact uh, with, as I said, oceans are where all the action is right now as oceans change around uh, the, the, the um, margins around the periphery uh, of Antarctica, both east and west, uh, east and west Antarctica respond differently uh, because as uh, glaciers retreat uh, and the ice sheet retreats from the ocean, um, it, at some point in east Antarctica, it uh, rises up away from the ocean and is no longer affected as much by the ocean. Whereas in West Antarctica, the ocean is always there. Doesn't matter what happens to the size of West Antarctica, whether it gets bigger or smaller, the ocean is always there uh, uh, around its margin, um, kind of uh, uh, having the ability to to uh, melt it or 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 uh, introduce warm water or, or or changing currents or whatever it is. So on the on the left is uh, an outline of Thwaites Glacier. Uh, the red the red box on the right side is zoomed in on the left side, uh, and this uh, scale for that is um, uh, so that's about uh, the, the the two degrees uh, from seventy four to seventy six. Uh, that's 220 kilometers, and and so that gives you some sense of the uh, uh, of the size of of this map. So oh, there's a little scale bar there, 200 kilometers. So this is a a, a few hundred kilometers. The Thwaites Glacier is about three or four hundred kilometers long, about the same wide, and on average, uh, about a kilometer and a half to, or or uh, a little bit more in thickness. So it's uh, considerably thicker in the interior and then thins as it get, gets closer to the continent. My point is this is a vast glacier. Uh, it is, uh, 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 so I've overlaid Antarctica on North America uh, to give you a sense of scale of the place. Thwaites Glacier is just this little corner of it here, but just that one glacier is, uh, as it says on the right there, bigger than many places that you might be familiar with. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it is, as I said, just one glacier. I, again, it's, you know, it's hard to, to grasp the scale of this place. Imagine driving on I-80 across Pennsylvania and the entire time uh, you have a kilometer and a half of ice over your head uh, as you drive along and all of the hills and mountains and valleys that, that you drive over are all completely uh, completely hidden from people that might be walking on top of you. But all those mountains and hills and valleys uh, all affect how that glacier would be flowing. So what is what are the hills? What are they made of? How big are they? How small are they? Uh, when you're on top of the glacier, uh, you don't know unless you do this the type of geophysical imaging that we're doing. Uh, so uh, if all of Thwaites Glacier's ice, as I said, it's a vast uh, glacier, 
If all of it were to go into the ocean, sea level rise would rise by something like two thirds of a meter, a couple of feet. Now, to me, that's probably one of the most astonishing statements uh, in, in, in all of, of the work that we're doing. This one single glacier would lay a, a layer of ice around all the oceans of, of the whole planet, which is a big planet with big oceans on it uh, of, of two thirds of a meter. That's how much uh, water there is in there. Uh, the question that we uh, are asking is um, how likely is that? How, uh, 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 if, it, if it is happening, uh, what rates are it ha happening at and, and what can we look forward to? Uh, on the right side, you have a photograph of Kuwait's glacier. It's flowing to the right. The, the flat rounded bit is the ice shelf and the um, sort of uh, the, the, the hill that, that I'm taking the photograph from, it's from an airplane, uh, with all the crevasses on it are because the glacier is flowing up and over uh, uh, a little hill at the grounding line and is breaking up as it does so. Once it gets out onto the flat ice shelf, it um, it heals to a certain degree, although these crevasses are still there and buried. Uh, Thwaites is a marine glacier. So on the right hand side of that photograph where, where it's flat, that sort of arcuate bit where it's flat, that's ocean. That's ocean underneath there with all of the all of the um, uh, consequent uh, kind of uh, influences of the ocean, warming ocean, changes in current, changes in wind and so on. To the left here, where it's all broken up and cracked, uh, that's the actual glacier. The glacier itself is still flowing on rock on the left side. It's flowing on, on ocean on the right side. And in that transition is where all of the initiating action for uh, changes in glaciers happens. That's where the ocean can, quote, get at uh, Thwaites Glacier. Now, to the left of this, where Thwaites Glacier continues on inland, that part responds to changes at the grounding line. But as I said, how it responds is very much associated with its bed. How deep is the bed and what its properties are. The bed is deep, it's well below sea level. Uh, the surface of the glacier here is only a few hundred meters above sea level, but the bed is uh, a good thousand meters below sea level. The ice here is uh, maybe not a thousand meters, I think the ice here is about 800 meters thick. And so you have a little bit above sea level and a whole bunch below sea level. Uh, Thwaites Glacier is a key part of the West Antarctic ice sheet. <clears throat> As you saw in that, in all the various maps I've shown you, uh, Thwaites Glacier is part of this larger part uh, of the continent that we call West Antarctica. And if Thwaites Glacier is affected, then other, other pieces would be as well. So uh, a litany of superlatives. Uh, this is a photograph looking the other direction. Now I'm standing on the Thwaites Glacier ice shelf, uh, looking up towards Thwaites Glacier. The flat bit in the foreground is the ice shelf. And then that uh, hill, which is a, a, a good 75 meters or so high, uh, three people for scale in the far distance. Um, and, and it's about five kilometers away. Uh, that is the glacier itself uh, and, and on into the, into the background. It is one of the widest glaciers, one of the largest, one of the deepest, one of the fastest flowing on Earth. Uh, sadly, another superlative, superlative, it is susceptible to losing mass the quickest as well. And that's what uh, we're trying to understand better. Uh, the grounding line could re retreat rapidly uh, with the mass uh, going into the oceans. The mass has nowhere else to go. So the big question is how rapid. Um, so uh, the, to emphasize again that East Antarctica and West Antarctica are different, uh, on, the, uh, on the right hand side, those uh, uh, lovely rainbow colored uh, 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 plots of Antarctica show the uh, uh, volume or the thickness of ice uh, that is uh, um, uh, afloat effectively. Uh, so if you were to, um, if you were to uh, take that ice and, 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 and send it off into the ocean, so the ice on the right-hand side is above sea level on the right-hand side of Antarctica. In East Antarctica, all those gray bits uh, are all well above sea level, except for the 
pieces right near the coast, the, the red kind of scrim around the coast on the right, right hand side of East Antarctica. Those are the only parts of the East Antarctica that are really uh, vulnerable to the kinds of marine influence. Everything else is well above sea level. That's not the case in West Antarctica. As you can see, almost all of it is below sea level and, and um, is, is susceptible to ocean influences. <clears throat> Excuse me. I should note in passing, uh, and I think this will become important in the decades ahead, there are pieces of East Antarctica, uh, uh, particularly in, I, should, I was going to say in, in the northern parts, all north, uh, in the part, uh, in the lower right part of East Antarctica, the part that's uh, near Australia or directly south of Australia, where there's a, a fairly large part of it that is susceptible to the same sorts of processes that West Antarctica is currently undergoing and that that part of East Antarctica could undergo in the, in the decades ahead. And I should note that East Antarctica is very much the big sister to West Antarctica. The volume of ice in East Antarctica is immeasurably larger, uh, where West Antarctica has in toto uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, five meters of sea level rise equivalent within it. Uh, East Antarctica has 10 times that. So. Uh, uh, we should keep our eye very much on East Antarctica as well. And I think what we learn at Thwaites Glacier will inform those studies. So one of the great um, sort of concerns is very much what's called the marine ice sheet instability. Um, on, on the top left, and I'll zoom in on that in a second, uh, you have a, a schematic of what Thwaites Glacier looks like. Uh, cross section with uh, the Amundsen Sea, the ocean on the left, uh, and the glacier on the right, and the change in color uh, is from that ice which is above sea level to that ice that's below sea level. So let me go forward to that one. So uh, this line that cuts across Thwaites Glacier, everything above it is above sea level, and everything below it is below sea level. On the left, you have the ice shelf that I've been showing you photographs of. Uh, the most recent picture I showed you, I was standing on here, looking off to the right and watching as it went from being the flat bit of the ice shelf up onto the um, uh, sloping interior of Thwaites Glacier. So the marine ice sheet instability says that because you have a bed, so the, the brown bit at the bottom is the bed, so the ice is sitting on top of rock over here, and the rock obviously has jigs and jags and, and ups and downs in it, much like Pennsylvania or any other place does. And uh, as the glacier, uh, the grounding line steps back because of ocean influences. So to emphasize once again, these changes initiated at the ocean. The ocean warms, excuse me, uh, 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 ocean currents change, uh, melt increases. And because of that, at the grounding line, the, uh, the grounding line uh, changes and steps back. And that's what's in the lower plot over here. It went from being on this spot to being uh, you know, a few kilometers or tens of kilometers further inland. Uh, the key there is that the ice at the grounding line is now considerably thicker than it was over here. I said before the ice here is, a, is about uh, 800 meters thick today. Well, in 10, 20, 30 years when the ice uh, grounding line shifts back, now the ice is thicker, 1,000 meters or 1,200 or something like that. And uh, uh, Glaciology 101, ice cares deeply about how thick it is. That's one of the uh, most important parameters uh, that we need to know about an ice to understand it is how thick it is. And as you can see, it gets thicker as, as the grounding line steps back. This tends to increase the flow of ice uh, through the grounding line because, as I said, ice cares how thick it is, and it and it's more it flows more readily. Uh, uh, all of the things being equal, it flows more readily if if the ice is thicker. Uh, and so, as the ice steps back, it gets progressively thicker, which increases the flow, which has a tendency. To, uh, uh, to make its grounding line step back further, which thickens it, which increases the flow. So this is the instability 
uh, that, uh, that um, was first identified as a possibility back in the 60s, and that we're still uh, trying to, uh, to, to get rates on um, uh, to, to, to understand how it, 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 the, 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 the modeling and the physics are all pretty clear it happens. The question is how fast does it happen and, and how unstable is the instability? So uh, it, a small retreat promotes further retreat, which then promotes further retreat. <clears throat> Our um, view on this is that basal sliding is key. Thwaites Glacier moves by sliding over its bed, and we need to know what that bed is like. As I said, there's a kilometer and a half of, of ice between us at the surface and the bed down below, and so we need to know things like topography, uh, bed strength, smoothness, and wetness. All these things, including the distribution of water beneath the glacier, are what uh, really are, are critical to our, our ability to model and project uh, what the glacier might do in the, in the future. So this is a um, uh, uh, paper by uh, my colleague Byron Perizek, uh, and the details uh, we can go into uh, later on, but effectively uh, what we're looking at two different is two different beds. Uh, everything else is the same. This is a cross section through Thwaites. Ocean now is on the right, and glaciers, uh, the glaciers on the left. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, all, the only thing that, that Byron changed uh, was what the properties of the bed uh, looked like, uh, uh, and, and put that into the physics of his model and ran the model forward. Uh, and in the one case, uh, the one on the lower plot, uh, Thwaites didn't change a great deal. And in the other case, in the upper pot, uh, weights changed a great deal. So uh, our quest, uh, the, the question we have is uh, which of the two beds, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is, is Thwaites Glacier really best represented by? And that's the work of the GOES project and, and, and the, that we're uh, uh, doing the geophysics to try and, and determine that. Uh, so uh, this is my colleague Kai Riverman, uh, um, and we use explosives uh, to do seismic reflection work. This is really seminal work that was char uh, started by um, our uh, Columbia colleague Charlie Bentley and uh, uh, a number of his students and and myself. Uh, and really, we need to see what is underneath. Um, uh, Thwaites Glacier in detail. Uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, models that um, have been used have uh, kind of tried to assign one type of property to the bed of the whole glacier, and that is clearly uh, okay as a starting point, uh, but we need to move on beyond that to, to get uh, much, much more detailed uh, pro uh, information about the properties of the bed. So this is another view of Thwaites Glacier. Once again, uh, Amundsen Sea Oceans on the left, the glacier and the ice sheet is, are on the right. Um, the red box on Antarctica shows you the area we're looking at. Uh, if you can see the slightly darker blue bands that are all uh, tributaries of Thwaites Glacier, they're all coming together and flowing out to the left. Uh, those bands of color are the, the, the height of the bed, uh, either above or below sea level. In this case, it's almost entirely below sea level, as much as two kilometers below sea level in the central parts of, of, um, uh, uh, of Thwaites Glacier. And all of the ice is being channeled down through uh, Thwaites to the ocean on the left. Uh, in in the, uh, uh, about 20 years ago, we did two seismic reflection studies. Those are these two gray boxes over here. And in last year and this coming year, we're going to do uh, seismic studies that connect these two boxes up and extend it across to the side. So uh, the main uh, outcome of the work uh, or the main um, goal of the work is really to try and represent the, the properties of the bed. So in the lower part, a lower graph, you have a seismic reflection uh, uh, profile. Uh, this is the 
uh, uh, depth below the sur uh, depth below the surface. So we have ice that's in this case about two and a half kilometers thick, 24, 2,500 meters uh, of ice thickness. And so we're standing on the surface and we're looking down and we can see, oh, the ice is so thick here and it gets thinner and it goes up and down. It's got bumpy and it's got undulations and it's got hills and valleys and all of that. Uh, so that definitely tells us the first piece of information we know uh, we need to know, which is what the topography of the bed looks like. And you can do this from radar. You can do this from, from seismic work, uh, both of which are very effective at telling you what the uh, gross topography of the bed is. What is more, uh, well, possibly more important or as important is what is the rock here made up of? And that's what the middle plot over here with the tan band running through it. Uh, the, all of these dots are our attempt to estimate what the um, uh, softness or hardness of the bed. So uh, as you go up on, on this plot on the left, it's, that's labeled acoustic impedance. Uh, that's something that is quote, harder, uh, more dense, higher seismic velocity or both. Uh, than the bed, as you, uh, than, uh, than, than ice. Uh, as you go down, uh, it's uh, uh, material that is of um, lower density and lower seismic velocity uh, until this blue line here is with a few, with that one blue dot over there is water. There's uh, water, which we all know is effectively the same density as water, uh, as ice, but with a much uh, lower uh, seismic velocity. So really, real water is as soft as it gets. So you range from uh, harder rocks in the upper part and softer rocks to water as the components or properties of the bed um, in, in, as you go lower down in that graph. And you can see that different parts of the bed are very different. Some places are hard, some places are soft. Now, as geologists, that comes as absolutely no surprise to any of you. Uh, there's very little that is um, uniform and homogeneous in this world. Uh, that said, I should say as one caveat, there are these very weird creatures in you know, Western Antarctica called ice streams, the Cycle Coast ice streams that are quite uniform, but that's a story for another day. Uh, Hoyt's Glacier uh, is, uh, inhomogeneous. There are parts that are hard interspersed with parts that are soft. And it is the modeling of uh, A, the, the, um, uh, the uh, making maps of those properties and then turning those maps into models and projections uh, in the future that is really the core of what we're doing at Ghost. Uh, this is another uh, Plot. I apologize, the ice is now flowing from the right to the left, uh, but uh, very much a similar study. Uh, this is for the, the, the previous plot was for one of the gray boxes. This is for the other gray box. The scale is about 40 kilometers from left to right. Uh, and uh, you can see the bed kind of run through the middle there. Here the ice is a little bit deeper, a little bit thicker, about 2.7 kilometers. But the uh, the picture is still very much the same. You have areas of uh, soft sediment filled basin. You can see one very nicely represented on the right hand side there labeled L1 and L2. Uh, there's long, smooth, uh, uh, soft region. And then as you go to the left, you get these very uh, much more uh, bumpy and, 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 and uh, variable regions where you have hard bed interspersed with softer beds, so sediment fills, and, and it's our job to, to try and model that effectively. Um, our, uh, uh, the, the two boxes labeled LTHW and UTHW are the plots that I just showed you, the first one from LTHW and the other one from UTHW. Uh, what we're trying to do, what we did last season and that we will continue to do next season uh, is to connect those two boxes to extend the information a little bit to either side of them uh, and, and across the margin to, uh, to, to, the, um, uh, um, uh, to the east, uh, which is what was labeled the transverse line over there. 
the white boxes are uh, what we think, or the white outlines are what we think are subglacial lakes. So we uh, are fairly confident there's a great deal of water uh, underneath Waits Glacier, and it's pooled in those uh, three or four uh, lakes, subglacial lakes. Uh, how do those influence the flow? That's another thing that, that we're very, uh, very much intrigued by in all of this. Uh, what we, uh, the, 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 so the picture I showed you of Kaya looking uh, heroic with her uh, uh, sort of uh, ice axes and all of that, that was uh, one type of geophysical work. Uh, this is uh, the more industrial type of geophysical work. Uh, this is a vibrosized instrument. There's a circular plate. You, I don't know if you can see it in the middle. Uh, and this machine, um, which weighs, I don't know, 15 tons or something like that, uh, basically the, the, this circular ram gets lowered down and it lifts up the whole truck and then that plate vibrates. There's a big motor in the center of this uh, truck. It vibrates and then it puts energy into the snow and then the reflection of that energy can be uh, used in much the same way as when we use explosives uh, to, 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 to look at the bed. Uh, and this is that uh, a plot that is now uh, very similar to the, to the, to the two seismic uh, cross sections that I showed you before. Ice is flowing from right to left along the center line of Kuwait's glacier. Uh, and it is uh, now 220 kilometers of data rather than 20 or 40 kilometers, which is what those former ones were. And this was uh, really one of the great advantages of the uh, of um, the uh, this uh, um, uh, size instrument that uh, our colleagues at the German German Polar Research Institute, the Alfred Wegener Institute, have um, really spent a decade perfecting uh, uh, and and have really brought it to extraordinary work. Uh, to work so very well. And, and so the work that the, the plots that I showed you are really in these uh, small box over here and then another small box over here. And so we've already connected those two. Uh, this was work that was just done this last January. So work is in progress. We're processing it, we're looking at it, but you can already see from a plot, even a raw plot like this, that there's a great deal of variability uh, beneath Waits Glacier. We saw that to some degree in the, um, uh, in the early part of this work uh, uh, with, the, with the sort of 40 kilometer sections. And now we're seeing that that extends and po possibly is even more extreme as we get to, to, to larger scales. Um, so these critical parameters of the bed, uh, we use radar and I have colleagues at the, uh, at Columbia, Johnny Kingslake, uh, uh, one of your colleagues there, uh, is using radar to understand uh, uh, internal layer geometries, to understand how the ice is flexing and, and straining. Uh, colleagues at the University of Wisconsin and at Edinburgh in um, uh, the UK are doing radar to get bed topography. We have colleagues at Kansas, Lee Stearns and others, and uh, using satellite data and then uh, 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 seismic reflection work that I've been talking about. And then we're also trying to use electrical methods. Uh, again, colleagues at Columbia and others using magnetotelluric uh, methods to try and, and estimate what the bed looks like. So we're trying to throw all the, all the tools uh, that we have at this problem in order to, to really get at this question of um, uh, um, what, are, what does the bed look like? Um, I'll sort of say one last thing and then I'll probably stop it here in the interest of time. Uh, as I said, uh, if you drove along I-80 in Pennsylvania, you would go from the flat bits of Eastern Pennsylvania and it would go up in the Laurel Highlands, it would get high, get low, uh, and you'd see all this gorgeous topography around. Uh, all of that is, uh, really quite small scale compared to when you have a kilometer of a kilometer and a half or two kilometers of ice sitting on, or in some of these places, two and a half kilometers of ice sitting on top of all of that topography. And yet it does matter, even though these are very, very small, 
Uh, glaciers flow over and around those bumps. They have to flow over and around those bumps in the bed. They have to move sediments and water around those bumps. And those sediments and water really control the flow of the glacier. So this is a field trip on the right uh, with one of my colleagues, Atsumuto, uh, who's at the temple, and some of our students, um, Sierra, Emily, and others, uh, who are uh, looking at some uh, recently deglaciated terrain in front of a glacier, uh, Solheim Yokel in Iceland. Um, and, uh, you know, these are very dramatic, very amazing, two, three meter tall rocks, all striated and polished. Uh, but you have to understand for a glacier that's a kilometer and a half for two kilometers, the question is how important are these uh, 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 peas under the under the mattress. So the models need to include this effect and to understand what scale of obstacle is important and how it it controls and channels water at the bed. Uh, so I think I'm going to actually end it right there. Uh, I have. Uh, Sorry, you know, I haven't given one of these talks in about a year's time and I've grown out of out of uh, practice. I have way, way, way too many uh, uh, plots uh, and I apologize for that. I should have done better. Um, uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, we need people to study, model and project what Thwaites and other glaciers may do in the in the future. Uh, and I'd like to uh, make a plug uh, for uh, kind of trying to change the face of, of glaciology. Um, it has been, uh, present evidence notwithstanding, uh, really a, a, a uniformly white uh, male uh, 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 province. And the people affected by climate change are uh, people of color, uh, people from the global south and we need those people to ask the questions how does how does uh do changes in polar regions affect us in in um, communities of color that are vulnerable to to climate change and we haven't done a very good job of increasing the the diversity the the, the look of our science there are many many more women but uh it's still very very much uh it's a white continent in, 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 in all ways. Uh, uh, we need data from Thwaites. Uh, we need what the bed looks like in detail. And finally, we need to act to slow the warming of the oceans and the atmosphere. That's really the, the kind of uh, um, my, my hope looking forward that we, that we can get lots of good people and, and we can get lots of information and we can act on uh, what those people and that information is telling us. Um, you can go to thwaitesglacier.org uh, to, to see more, um, and we have tons of partners from Columbia, Washington, Kansas, uh, really uh, all across the country and indeed all around the world. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop it there and, uh, and, and open it up for questions. Thanks very much, Shida. It was great. Uh, do we have any questions? <laughs> I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, from what you've learned so far about the bedrock and, and uh, you know, the properties of the, uh, both the ice and, and the underlying bedrock. Uh, what can you say about uh, Thwaites in the near future? Is it more likely to, um, you know, retreat faster uh, and get into this marine instability or uh, are there obstacles, um, subglacial obstacles that might slow it down in the immediate future? Yeah, uh, so uh, we're we're struggling with that question, and uh, under some some uh, iterations of the bed, we really do have to to worry quite a bit. Uh, realistic iterations of bed, but bed one in which 
uh, sediments pool in the in the lee side of these bumps, which our our studies are showing is very much the case that the glacier moves the water and the sediments from the upper side of the bumps and moves them around, and then they they kind of puddle in the in in the lee side. And as the glacier flows along, it continues to do that as an active process. Uh, that that's actually quite a, a, a effective way to move ice through the system. And, and it could be one that, that, that does result in, in, in fairly rapid retreat of, uh, uh, of the grounding line. Um, the, uh, the one thing that I didn't talk about that uh, our colleague uh, Dave Pollard has highlighted is that um, as, the, as the face of the glacier gets further back, the uh, the the wall that picture the very first picture I showed you of of the ocean and then the sort of wall of ice coming up well that wall gets higher and higher as the grounding line goes back um, and uh, uh, that's uh, the, that wall is itself unstable can break off can uh, start to lose mass just because. Tall things don't like to be tall. Tall things like to break off and fall down. Uh, and so as that wall gets taller and taller, it's more likely to fracture and break. And, and, and that cliff could have an additional effect. And, and so both of these things, what we think what the bed looks like as, a, as, as something that is dangerous to the stability of, of, of Thwaites, and what the face looks like, a tall cliff, un unbuttressed by any ice in front of it, both of those things are really quite worrisome for the future of Thwaites. So uh, I, would, uh, I would keep a very close eye on what Thwaites is doing over the next 100 years. Those of you will be around for the next 100 years. We have a question from Gavin. Hi, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, and so I guess this is related to, uh, to, to Vivian's question, uh, but it's really the question of attribution. How close are we, or what do we need to do uh, in order to be able to say uh, what's happening now? Why, why is what's happening now happening, right? So is this, uh, is this something that was just gonna happen anyway? Is this related to, changes in the winds because of ozone holes? Is it related to global warming? It's like, you know, to what extent, you know, we can look at these things and say, okay, well, this is, this is happening and this is gonna be a big deal and it's contributing to sea level. But really the question is like, you know, how much of this would have happened without human activity and, and how much of it is because of what we've done already and therefore what we may do in the future? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Uh, uh, so uh, one of the one of the kind of um, difficulties of the marine ice sheet instability uh, thing is, and I showed the picture of 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 Thwaites grounding line and and how the bed is sloping back from there. Um, we keep saying Thwaites is going to step back into that bowl, into that basin, and it will uh, result in in dire things. Uh, this is the first glacier that, or ice sheet that has approached that instability limit. Uh, most uh, of Antarctica is still either at or or on the stable part of that uh, of that instability regime, where the bed is either still relatively flat, or if if anything is prograde, uh, it's. Thwaites is the first glacier that's right at the edge of falling into this instability region. So we, we are in a little bit of the uh, role of Chicken Little saying, uh, we're all in trouble, we're all in trouble, but we haven't been in trouble in the past. We just think that we will be in trouble in the future. So that's that's one issue of you know, that we don't have a, a, an actual modern day uh, uh, example of, of this process. It's very much from the from the modeling. Uh, so the attribution to, to, to what's going on comes from the modeling. Now, as to the, the thing kicking off weights, the thing that has brought it to the edge and may move it into this in unstable regime, I think, the, I think the consensus is pretty confident that the temperatures in the Amundsen Sea have uh, risen because of 
uh, changes in global in, in ocean temperatures and changes in circulation that have come about because of those changes in ocean temperature and uh, uh, winds that are uh, uh, a, a little bit more um, uh, a little bit stronger because of the larger temperature gradient between uh, a warmer ocean and sub and 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 um, uh, offshore regions and and a colder Antarctic. So slightly stronger winds uh, leading to to stronger circulation. So I think the attribution is actually pretty clear that uh, ocean temperatures around Antarctica are due to warming ocean. Uh, or 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 changes in ice shelf, uh, uh, these marginal ice shelves around Antarctica do are due to changing ocean temperatures, which are themselves due to uh, changing to, due due to the global um, uh, uh, the the warming due to human activity. So uh, I think most folks are pretty pretty okay with that kind of a statement. And and really, what we're looking at is the rates of of retreat uh, that come after that, which. I have to say, are obviously uh, the bed is completely insulated from all uh, surface processes so far, at least. So there's nothing going on at the bed that that is yet come from the surface. Um, we worry that that could happen in the next fifty years or so. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Well, I mean, it's a it's a tricky uh, it's a tricky situation because you don't really have any. I mean, attribution is obviously a modeling is a model based activity and we don't really have as yet a model that has everything in it right in in any way that's really credible and so it becomes a very difficult thing to do yeah and, and as i said not only do not have a model with everything in it but it would be great if we had uh examples of the process that that we're modeling to look at and 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 we don't this this retrograde marine ice sheet instability is is purely a modeling um, uh, uh, outcome, and and but it, it's a pretty robust one from the modeling viewpoint. Yes, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the some of the high resolution um, ocean models have been showing that the. Um, effect of latent heat release from, from melting of the ice shelf is to actually slow down the melting of the ice shelf um, because it cools the water and traps it onto the shelf in the shelf seas. And, and so you'll, you'll actually have a negative feedback on, on warm water, but it, it all depends on whether you by then you've reached the slope, um, negative slope and um, and, and and it doesn't actually matter what the, the the bottom temperatures are. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, and uh, I think that I I don't I couldn't speak to that, and so thank you for that. I will note there is another very intriguing negative feedback, which is uh, West Antarctica, at least this part of West Antarctica, uh, <clears throat> has extremely rapid uplift rates. Uh, as the ice mass is being reduced, uh, the, uh, the the mantle is returning underneath it, and then the lithosphere is rising up, and and so the rock around all of this part of West Antarctica is actually coming up at at, at just phenomenal rates so, of you know kind of centimeter per year in some places, if not more. Uh, and so one um, sort of uh, stabilizing negative feedback is that the bed is itself rising and and could uh, lead to a little bit of, of um, re-stabilization of the ice shelf. Uh, you can't depend on this in the long term because in the end, the warming ocean and, and the and breaking ice will win. But I thought that was a very uh, intriguing uh, result or uh, interesting uh, possibility. And, and West Antarctica is very unusual in how rapid those upward uplift rates are. Well, uh, do we have any other questions? We're at the hour now. So. 
there are no questions, then uh, I guess we can stop there. So thanks again, Sridhar. Thanks for coming. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And uh, you can get my email and drop me a line if anybody needs it. We'll see you.